seat. I'm going to put uh, two options uh, up on the screen. Uh, I am leading a family that loves Jesus and loves sports. Those two things are not enemies. Those two things can work hand in hand and together. Uh, my son's name, his middle son's name is Brady. He loves football. If you've ever seen him, his body looks like a football player's body. He is a tank. He plays up because they are afraid that he will hurt people in his own age group. Uh, and so he has dreams of playing uh, college football, Division One. His dream is to be uh, the first middle linebacker ever to win the Heisman Trophy. Uh, he wants to be in the NFL. He wants to be in the Hall of Fame. And so if you are a Christian dad, uh, guiding a kid in the area of sports. There are two options on the screen. Would you try to guide your son to be more like option one or more like option two? We have uh, somebody who was drafted a little bit higher but went on to have no Pro Bowls, no MVPs, uh, a few passing touchdowns, uh, not many passing yards. He, uh, both guys uh, played in the, uh, were drafted in pro baseball, uh, but the option one has so much more to his resume. And if you have followed sports, I'm sure you know who option one is. Tom Brady. Now number two, Landon, go ahead and show the pictures. Here are the two people in these pictures. One is Tom Brady, who I named my son after. One is Tim Tebow, who I will likely name my next dog after in the word of Tebow. Uh, and so if you're going to guide your son now towards being like one of these two individuals, now with their pictures on the screen, I bet you would tell me option two. Why? Because one of them played for the glory of God. One of them obviously played for the glory of God. They both sacrificed. They, they both went through their hardships. Tom Brady is known for sacrifice. He's known for crazy diets. He's known for putting the team first. He's known for uh, uh, being a guy that sacrifices and goes through hardship and he gets his own accolades through that, but he gives credit to the team. There's, he knows how to sacrifice for the glory of the team, but so does Tim Tebow. But Tim Tebow, it was not only the glory of the team, it was also the glory of God. <laughs> you Google Tim Tebow, John 3, 16, you're gonna hear some wild <laughs> stories around that. And so if you're going to guide somebody to be like somebody, yes, it's obviously the name of Jesus Christ, but Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I want to guide my son, first and foremost, to play as hard as he can, to sacrifice, but in all that he does to play for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's hard to do that when we're going, when we have to choose to go through hardship. To choose hardship as we sacrifice for a team or, or sacrifice for a loved one. And we have a hard time when it comes to this glory word, don't we? So whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, we have a hard time living for somebody else's glory as we what, instinctively, whether we're conscious of it or not, some of us are and some of us aren't, we instinctively want our own glory and that creates a battle. Who's glory are we living for and are we willing to sacrifice and experience hardship for his glory and so we're going to be in john chapter 11 today yes it is palm sunday but it, this verse and this kind of leads up to palm sunday uh, and right before that there is this story of jesus and perhaps the most famous resurrection apart from jesus's himself the story of Lazarus. And so if you grew up in my mom's generation, if you were a kid in my household, you might be thinking of this guy named Carmen who sang a song about Lazarus. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. It's a wild video. Uh, anyways, I digress. We're going to talk about the story of Lazarus. He's a good friend to Jesus. He has two sisters. Uh, one's hardworking, one's a hippie. Uh, and so he has two sis sisters, Mary and Martha. There's plenty of stories about how close this family was, but here's what you need to know. They were close. They were buddies. They were friends. They knew about Jesus' life. They knew about his miracles. They knew Jesus better than most. So Lazarus gets sick. The sisters send word to Jesus. 
Hey, your buddy, our brother, he's sick. Jesus, you've, you've healed people with a lesser relationship. Surely you're going to come and do something now, right? <laughs> they send word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick, and then they just wait, hope, and watch. Here's the word we're going to pick it up in verse 4. Here's the verse that says, But when Jesus heard it said, the illness, he, he said, The illness does not lead to death. It is for what? Glory. The glory of God, the Son of God, may be glorified through it. He's healed strangers. They send word to Jesus, and then they sit by their brother's bed, waiting and hoping. Have you been there? Saying a prayer, waiting and hoping. Jesus does not see this leading to death. He says this will not end in death. He doesn't say death won't be a possibility. He says death won't have the final word. What Jesus sees in the situation is glory. This is about glory. This is about glory. So have you been in a situation? Are you in a situation that feels like all odds are against you? Against all odds. Everything is mounting. I have a sick, sick loved one. You might not see glory. But does Jesus, one of our first questions always when we're going through a, a situation that feels like the odds are against us, is to get out of it. We're human, right? If I feel pain, if I feel the pressure, I want it gone, gone, gone. Our instinct is to get out of it, let it be gone, not to wade in it to bring glory to God. But it, what's, it's what he wants. And so our big thought for this experience as we unpack this text is if glory is what he wants, then glory is what we should give. If glory is what the Son of God desires, then everything you and I do should be around giving him glory. And so as we unpack this narrative, we're going to see four areas in which we can give God glory. The first one is glory in obedience. Here's how the story now continues. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Love, love, love compels him. Love guides his thinking. Love is his feeling towards this family. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. Does that feel like love? Do that, does that seem like they, that should go hand in hand? In the place where he was, then after he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, you're tripping. No, they didn't say that. But they said something along the lines, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And now you're going to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, uh, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, My friend, La our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant He's taken rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, looks around and says, let us also go that we may die with him. A guy with a lot of hope and energy. Let's go die, guys. Was it loving for Jesus to stay those two extra days? It says that he loves his family, but Jesus also stayed two extra days. It didn't feel loving in the moment, but what we've looked at in this series is aren't feelings oftentimes fallible? Because here's the truth that I do think that you would agree with through life experiences, is that human love is in a rush. Human love is in a hurry. Divine love isn't in a hurry. Divine love isn't rushing around. God works on his timetable and he's good with it. But in our emotions and in our feelings, we feel a way about God. Here's another perspective that Jesus is bringing out in this moment. He sees death differently than we do. We see death as this final thing, this absolute thing. He's able to call it sleep 
Because for Jesus, waking a dead person is no different than you and I going home and having to awaken a child who's asleep. Jesus can do that with the same level of ease. He also sees the circumstances that the group finds themselves in differently than that of the group. They know Jesus has had to escape a crowd when they wanted to stone him. They know the rumors that Jesus, that the religious leaders, they're two miles away when they get to Bethany where this takes, resurrection takes place. They know this is in the area where Jesus could die and they don't see Jesus the way that Jesus should be seen at that moment. And so if Jesus dies, all hope goes with him. So Jesus, you want to go where? Huh? That's, that's ludicrous. We know Thomas, he has a common name of Doubting Thomas. But really, you could call him Logical Thomas, couldn't you? Because if you were to write it on a board, it's completely logical for Thomas to see and to feel, Jesus, if you go here, you will very likely die. And before we cast judgment on Thomas, guess what? He's right. Jesus dies in Jerusalem at the hands of the religious leaders like he's saying. But here's what Thomas does as is an example to us. He has reason, he sees it right, but he gets to the point where he says, well, if we die, we die, we're going. You could actually look at that comment as a super positive thing because he sees the situation correctly and then chooses obedience. We celebrated in March our sixth year, seven year anniversary, whatever it was. Uh, we were in 2017. It all runs together. Uh, and so, but, but the point being is that I do think that we probably should have started this church a, about a year earlier. Why? Because when Pastor Ritter at Bayside Chapel uh, came to me and said, hey, why don't you think about starting a, uh, starting a church? I was like, you're tripping, ain't no way. Like, I'm good. Because what did I do? What, is a, what does your mind do when you have an opportunity before you? What does your mind do when things are stacked against you and you have to take a step? We, whether we make a physical one or not, we start to make a pros and cons list, don't we? If you don't physically do it, you do it up here. And so when this situation was being presented to us, Ava and I naturally made a pros and cons list. Well, why would, why would we go? Here are the cons to going. Well, financially, I was a youth pastor and doing pretty good as a youth pastor. I was comfortable. We had a house that we were paying off. We lived in a neighborhood we didn't mind. It was fine. We had a location that we loved. We had a, a church. Uh, let's make a steeple, whatever. Uh, we had a church family that we loved. We don't have family in the area. We had a great church. Why would we leave? We had a youth ministry of, of, of people, people, people. We had such a great youth ministry that was, that was crushing it. Why would we leave that? Why would we go to the unknown? Why would we go to uh, a place like Ava was like, what about healthcare? I'm like, I don't know how we're going to, I don't know. Okay, well, she wasn't really going to, ah. So all of these cons, why would we do this? And then it got to the point where we went to this church planning assessment and Ava was in a worship set, I was in a worship set and, and, and separately, but then together at the same time, we felt one pro. <laughs> we prayed and felt God's leading. So here's my question. When you're uh, logical Thomas and you have a situation before you and you make your pros and cons list, Does God work on a pros and cons list? Because my God's otherworldly. My God thinks so much differently than us. And so if the only pro is the will of God, will you say yes? Okay, well, let's flip it. What if the only con is it's not the will of God? It makes complete sense to jump in and do this. But it just doesn't feel like the will of God. Will you not do it? Will you jump to prayer? Will you hurry to prayer to hear the voice of God? How does this play out? You just got offered a promotion that's going to give you $15,000 more a year. It's going to be awesome, 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 awesome. But it doesn't feel right. That's not the will of God. I've been praying. Will you say no? 
Your whole life you've been saying, I'm going to go to this school, this school, this school. It's your senior year of high school. Your parents, your family, everybody's so excited for you to go to this school, but you feel it's the will of God for you to go to this school. Will you say yes to the will of God? She doesn't look like the type of girl that I would marry, but when I'm with her, I'm more like Jesus. I really feel God leading me towards her, but, but she doesn't have that look. Will you go after the will of God and not your preference? This plays out so much in our everyday life. And the point is, despite your pros and cons list, will you go after whatever will bring God glory despite the list? The second thing that we see in this text is that there is glory in the struggle. So Jesus arrives on the scene. He gets to the scene. Lazarus has been dead for four days. Jewish custom was that at the end of four days, the likelihood of resurrection is gone. So now all hope is lost. He's two miles from Jerusalem. There's a crowd. It's a tense scene. Martha comes to see Jesus, but Mary remains in the house. And now here's how the story goes. The glory in the struggle. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask, that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And anyone who lives and believes shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the Christ? I am the only one. Yes, Lord, I believe. You are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. They sent word to Jesus for agonizingly long days with a dead brother in the tomb. What are you feeling? What are you thinking if you're one of these two sisters? Would you still believe when Jesus said, this will not end in death, as your brother sits in a grave, would you still hang on to that promise? To Martha's credit, she's open with her disappointment. She's open with her that, that, that she doesn't, this did not end the way that she wanted it to end. And yet she's also community, uh, communicating as she's expressing her feelings, great faith. And Jesus never rebukes her. He's patient. He listens. It's okay to be emotional with Jesus because we're going to Jesus and letting him inform us in our emotions. Jesus is quick and to, your, to the point. He will rise again. He does not say, I can resurrect people. He doesn't say, I have life. What does he say? I am. I am resurrection. I am life. He does not say what he can do. He says who he is. So what is the situation that you are in? You're not putting your hope in a what if, you're putting your hope in the person of Jesus Christ where nothing can hinder him from anything that he chooses to do. And he promises that if you believe in the person that he is, I am the resurrection, I am the life. If you put your faith in the person of Jesus Christ, though you may die physically, you will never taste ultimate death. That you have the resurrection of the saints and that you will live forever with Christ Jesus. That we have faith that this world could throw the ultimate uh, horror of everything at us. We die, but we die as people with hope that we will live forever. We have nothing to worry about. So can we trust Jesus when, when we feel like we're in a season of waiting? Can we trust Jesus when we feel like he's not responding anymore? Can we trust Jesus when waiting makes us feel a whole bunch of ways? 
Uh, the two weeks ago, I guess it was at this point, I went a long hike in Virginia. It's called the Triple Crown, 35 miles. And uh, day two was going to be the hardest, about 16 miles, uh, probably around 6,000 feet of elevation on day two. It was a hard, hard day. I went with a guy named Doug, uh, my buddy Doug. And so there was a group text between me, Doug, Amanda, his wife, and Ava. Uh, and so we were like, hey, pray for day two. It's going to be 16 miles. It's going to be hard. And uh, we just like, we're, we're going to struggle through it. Uh, we left early in the morning. We left around 8 a.m. I uh, didn't get into camp around 7.30, and we were hiking every moment in between there. It was hard. And at the end of the day, our batteries were running low, and we ran out of service. And Ava went crazy uh, in love. She all of a sudden was like, I, I, woke, I got up to text messages and like uh, uh, service again. And I got a, I, the one text message I saw, enjoy your hike because this is the last time you'll ever do it again. Uh, I talked to her after the fact and she was like, no, I was okay. I, I got to the point where I was okay after <laughs> breathing into a bag. Like I started thinking like, okay, you're dead. And I'm, I, she, I convinced, she said, I convinced myself that I was going to be able to manage without you. She said that. And she said to me, like, I still have follow-up conversations. Like, what, is, what does that look like? I didn't have service for 12 hours, and Ava started planning life without me. What do you do in the waiting? Where do you go in the waiting? When it feels like Jesus is out of service, although he is not, what do you do? Do you trust Jesus in the waiting? Do you trust Jesus when what is before you seems final and absolute? Because Jesus sees Mary and Martha in a season of waiting. Mary and Martha feel like they're living in a world of absolutes. So how do you bring God glory? You bring him glory when you trust even when it seems like there's absolutes. The second area that we can give God glory, or the third area, we can give God glory in grief. When he said this, he went and he called her sister, Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here. He is calling you. And when, he, and when she heard, she arose quickly, went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. When, G, when, the, when the Jews who were with her in the house, uh, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly, immediate obedience, and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was, he saw him. And she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, same thing, my brother would not have died. But when he saw her weeping, the Jews had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Say Jesus wept. Great, you just memorized scripture. <laughs> so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not have opened the eyes of the blind? This man also kept this man from dying. Mary's tears are honest. There's nothing wrong with her tears. She expresses the feelings, the shared feelings that Martha had. If only, if only, if only. How many times, if we're honest in our emotional selves, do we look up to heaven and say the same thing? If only, if only, if only. You had followed my plan. This probably would have gone differently. Jesus, catch this, feels her emotions. Jesus wades into the emotions. Mary is troubled, so Jesus is troubled. Jesus is the one that is crying alongside both of these sisters. Jesus, catch this, could have avoided all of these emotions by healing from afar. He's done that before, but instead he chose in this circumstance to go and to willfully put himself in a position to feel, to hurt, to cry with those who hurt and cry. So Jesus is with you and I in our pain. Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus is not pretending to be human. He is human. Feeling the emotions 
of the humanity that he helped create, wading into the emotions of humanity. I've been open with you guys in the last two and a half years or so. My family has experienced some loss. When people came alongside me, what did it cost them? When, when, I, when we struggled loss and I needed to get down to Virginia as soon as I could, Graham Wilson the next morning drove me to Cherry Hill to meet my parents. What did it cost him? $5 in gas, time, and then all he preached a sermon for me on a wild text. <laughs> Ask him about it. It just cost him, what? In the end, time, presence. When, when, when I lost my grandfather, when I was in, uh, in Brazil, even I wanted to be there to tell our kids, physically be there. We had to tell them over FaceTime. And it was Krista and Laura that were there to hug my kids when mom and dad couldn't be there to break the news. What did it cost them? Time. And presence. And now I look back on those two horrific scenes from my life and am forever grateful at three people that waded in with their time and their presence to cry with those who cry, to weep with those who weep, to hurt with those who hurt. They did not have to. They could have said, it's a time for self-care. I'm going to avoid all emotional pain but they waited in to feel that pain. And I am forever thankful. Jesus is present in the pain. You want to glorify Jesus through pain? Wade in with somebody else. You want to glorify Jesus to be like Jesus? That is when you and I choose to willfully enter into somebody else's pain for the glory of God so that somebody else would know the presence of God through you as you sit there and you are just present in the pain. To be like the sun is to willfully enter into pain and not willfully exit because that brings him glory. And so Jesus, so deeply moved, calls out. He's waded through the grief. He's waded through struggle. He's waded through obedience. Martha, the practical one, is like, yo, Jesus, if you tell me to move this stone, like, the body stinks, like, <laughs> this, is, this is not practically going to make any sense, but Jesus wades in and brings glory in an outcome. So after telling them to remove the stone, here's how it goes. He said, or did I not tell you that if you believed that you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on an account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. There's a purpose to all of this. Jesus has a reason for all of this. And when he said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Three powerful words. The man who died came out, his hands, feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. He was dead as dead can be and alive as alive can be. And Jesus told them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus waded into the grief and then he did something about it. He demonstrated that all authority that he has comes from the Father through his prayer he gives all glory to the Father through this situation while also communicating that he has authority, he has power, he is unique, he is special. And with three loud words, almost in a very anticlimactic way, Lazarus, come out! And he does. Because it's no big deal for Jesus. <laughs> he can do it. And he does. And Lazarus comes out. If Jesus had followed the sisters' plans, none of this happens. If Jesus had followed the sisters' plans, less glory goes to Jesus. If Jesus had followed the sisters' plan, this scene that is so awesome and so crazy doesn't unfold the way it does. And the way it's supposed to unfold is something that Pastor Graham said last week. Why does this happen the way it happens? It happens so that we can proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. It happens so that the people around us, through our testimony, none of ourselves... But our testimony of God Almighty, that this testimony would bring glory to God. That those who do not see Jesus will see Jesus in the situation that we see Jesus. Because we are a people of faith. My kids used to do karate. 
I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but karate. I didn't grow up doing karate, but they did. Uh, they've done karate or whatever. And uh, they're all like Bruce Lee. I don't know, whatever. Uh, and so, but what I loved about it was it was all about honor, all about respect, all about like order and whatnot. And they would say a creed at the beginning of every class about like how to use power, how not to use power, how to fight, how not to fight, all these things. And then when they would go through a, a time where they would have to do a move or a combo and like, ha, 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 uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, I played sports, not like, I got. Uh, and so they would have to do that. And the instructor would get in the front of the class and say, eyes on me. And you know what the whole class would say? Eyes on you, sir. And he'd say, eyes on me. Eyes on you, sir. And then they would demonstrate the move. And you would always know the kids that were not paying attention. <laughs> because then they would, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Well, you did because he said, eyes on me, eyes on you. And you should have been watching. Because <laughs> they went through the moves. Here's what's coming. Eyes on me. Eyes on you, sir. When you don't pay attention to that, these next few moments are going to be that much harder for you. And you're probably going to take a sucker punch to the face because you didn't see it coming when I told you, block here, do this. We have God Almighty calling down from heaven saying, eyes on me. Our response is eyes on you, Lord. The world around us will never say that. The world around us will go through the same set of instructions or the same blah, 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 blah. Our eyes are on the Lord, seeing him through the situation. Their eyes aren't. So may we be the people of God, always saying, eyes on you. Try this to bring God glory in this situation. Instead of bringing God blame, which some of you are tempted to do right now, whatever the situation you might find yourself in, Focus in on glory and see how that shifts your perspective of the situation. What have we said? If glory is what he wants, then glory is what he will get. We can give him glory in obedience. We can give him glory in struggle. We can give him glory in the waiting. We can give him glory in the grief. We can give, give him glory in the outcome. This past Tuesday, I was moved like many of you were moved. I'm on the stair climber uh, at my gym. And before me are four TVs, and two of them are news stations, just over and over and over again, pictures of this person shooting down windows and walking into a school, and then roaming the hallways. And I, like, I, you get so desensitized at some point, don't you? Sadly. And, but this one hit me because uh, a young girl died who has older brothers and whose dad is a pastor. And it hit me, and I was like, I was super tempted to kind of stop my, tread, my, uh, my stair climber and go and be like, can you just turn these TVs off? Because it was like, boom, 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 boom. It hit me. And this church put out a statement that, that said this, together we trust in the power of Christ to draw near and give us the comfort and hope that we desperately need. I saw that statement, I was like, that would be Graham in this situation. He would write a statement like that and put it out on my behalf, if you will. And it just, it moved me. Could I, could I utter those words? <laughs> Even that. And we go to a place of, of, of what's the issue? Is this a Christian issue? Is this a gun issue? Is this a transgender issue? No, it's a Republican issue. No, no, it's a Democrat issue. No, it's this issue. No, it's this issue. No, it's this issue. Blame, 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 blame. It might have elements of a lot of those things. It's a sin issue. It's a sin issue. At the end of the day, I hope that those six people that died in that shooting called on the name of Jesus in faith as the Son of God. My prayer is that they died and experienced the resurrection of the saints and that their day ended in glory. My prayer for us, you, to my knowledge, are not a school shooter. But if we're going to be honest, that's not the first sin the shooter ever committed. There are so many other things leading up to that, leading up to that. So many other decisions, decisions, decisions leading up to that in our human perspective, so many lesser decisions leading up to that. So all but the grace of God, you and I have not done that. 
But the question the shooter should ask is the question that you and I should ask. What I am about to do, would somebody obsessed with the glory of God do that thing? What I am about to not do, would somebody obsessed with the glory of God do that thing? My son sits in the back. I do not want him to simply not have sex before marriage. Simply do not get a girl pregnant. I want him to be obsessed with the glory of God where that would be unthinkable. My prayer is not that you would simply not be a school shooter. My prayer is that you would be so obsessed with the glory of God that anything like that would be unthinkable. My, my prayer is that whatever you're about to do, if you are to hit a home run, that you would be obsessed with the glory of God. If you strike out, that you would be obsessed with the glory of God. If your family is alive, that you would be obsessed with the glory of God. If your family has died, that you would be obsessed with the glory of God. My prayer for you, my prayer for us, is that we would be obsessed with the glory of God in all that life brings our way. And so that's my challenge for you. Isle hosts are going to pass this sheet out to you. We're not passing out pens. Because I want you to sit and think about this. The, the first question is, an against all odds situation that I'm facing is, write it down, jot it out, verbalize what this is going on in your life. What feels like it is against all odds. Second, what are possible options? God, this is what I'm facing. And these are a handful of options that I could do in light of this. Third, the option I feel would bring God the most glory is blank because dot, dot, dot. And so my challenge to you is, this week, start attacking that option. I'm not saying that that option is the option. But live in it for a little bit, prayerfully considering, is this truly where God would have me and what he would have me do to bring him glory? Because whatever you're facing, may it be about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you guys stand and let me pray over us?